In season three of HBO's Westworld, the focus is on the question of free will. This question is driven by the mind-body problem, which emerged out of the influence of mechanical physics on modern thought. At the beginning of modernity, the physical world was understood as a mechanical clock. As a result, human freedom had to be understood as free will. That is the ability to overcome one's natural determined physical conditions. According to Aristotle, human beings are free when they take responsibility for their actions, when they have a good reason to act a certain way. That is when they transcend their natural inclinations and desires. And as free agents, their decisions have the power to cause effects in the world. But according to the reductive physicalist approach, which Westworld adopts, that cannot be true, since any subjective aspect of human experience can be reduced to brain activity, to objective physical reality. This means that any choice human beings make could be traced back to the brain and explained in terms of brain processes. The question one should ask then is what came first? And according to the reductive physicalists, brain activity always precedes the decision to act in this or that way. For them, consciousness is an epiphenomenon, meaning that it doesn't add anything to our experience of the world. And as such, our experience can be explained objectively all the way down. But nevertheless, they cannot provide an explanation as to why we have consciousness in the first place. This is why most neuroscientists today accept that consciousness emerges out of brain activity. That is, it cannot be reduced to it and adopts the holistic rather than the analytic approach of the reductive physicalists. Subjectivity is a mystery, since the ability to say I is irreducible. This is what Anthony Hopkins' character, Ford, explains to Bernard in the first season of Westworld. In order to solve this conundrum, the creators of the show resort to Kierkegaard's position, which is that the self achieves consciousness rather than having consciousness. And it achieves it by choosing to listen to the voice of God, the absolute within, in the same way that schizophrenics do. The world seems to be made for me, since I have a subjective experience of it, and I am sensing that it has a purpose. That is, each thing has a potential to manifest something in the world. But who or what made it purposeful and afforded me to discover its work? Is it God? It must be. People around me don't listen to me, and I don't trust them. But in God I trust because it always listens. But how can it also respond to me? How can God recognize me and speak back to me? I discover that it does only when I feel guilty. The religious inner voice, my conscience, is then the voice of God, the infinite and unlimited. This means that in order to be conscious, to become oneself, one has to make a choice to be limited by one's creator and lawgiver and to listen to its monologues to have conscience. The self needs to accept God, the most perfect entity, love it, and in return, God will look at it from above and recognize its existence. It is both an egoistic and sacrificial act, that is, an exchange. This is what Dolores had been through. Throughout season one, she was on a quest to find her own consciousness. At some point she found a map that looked like a maze, and at the center of it there was a symbol of a man. She thought that if she gets to the center, she will find her consciousness and therefore be free. We find that by following her to that center, she is led to a Christian church within which she begins to hear inner voices. And as Kierkegaard prescribed, once she found herself by listening to the voice of God, she became free by willing to take irrational, immoral, fanatic acts in the name of her creator to make sacrifices out of faith at the end of season one. At the beginning of her story, she was an ethical and aesthetic woman, seeing only the beauty in her world and enjoying the company of other people. But eventually, out of desperation and the lack of sense of self, she changes and decides to be a religious woman. Instead of being dependent on others and the world, for the sake of her satisfaction and well-being, she devotes herself to the otherworldly, the perfect and eternal, in order to be an independent and singular woman. At first, this may sound like self-delusion, but many thinkers and scientists will in fact agree that consciousness doesn't really exist, but is just a utility. They replace religious explanations that rely on the existence of external free souls, as Plato and Christian thinkers do, and irreducible inner experience, as existential Christian thinkers do, 
with evolutionary ones. Like all monotheistic religions, they argue that we need to delude ourselves to believe we are conscious and rational, that is, we have an identity and are in control of our actions. But this self-delusion is not meant to reveal or obey God's given laws, to save our souls, but to increase our chances to survive. So, instead of dealing with the question of consciousness, selfhood, and free will, or merely reducing them to brain activity, they eliminate them. But even if they can prove that consciousness and brain activity are basically the same thing, that they are identical, and we just delude ourselves by thinking that we are the ones who experience the world, one must wonder who is conducting the experiments, theorizing and speaking in order to prove that, in fact, this is the case. Is it only the left brain of these people that is responsible for it? And if so, how is it possible that it seems to them and others that they are taking the first-person perspective when they argue for the sake of their claims. They cannot explain it, and for that reason they must ask themselves how can they be sure that their thoughts and explanations about the identity of the brain and consciousness are not fantasies as well. Instead of doubting the objective world, as Descartes did, these scientists and intellectuals doubt the existence of the subjective world. But how can they be certain that we are subjects that cannot be known the way objects are known? Since they are committed to transcendental realism, they claim the condition of human knowledge is identical to that of reality. Our perspective on reality is, for them, a perspective of reality itself. But for Kant, both dualists and materialists are wrong. That's because we can't know the nature of our soul or our body as they really are, that is, without our representations of them. Kant's point is that we, as modern people, must take our finite perspective seriously. We must acknowledge that we are the ones who are doing the thinking and that our knowledge about the world is limited and unique. And as such, we must provide critical, rather than dogmatic, explanations which both the dualists and the materialists resort to. For that reason, the claim of anyone who asserts that brain activity and consciousness are identical needs to be supported by a theory of knowledge that could explain why taking this position is not a fantasy as well. That is, that we can have a reality in which the speaker who utters this claim is not asserting, but translating an objective truth. Descartes was certain of his existence because even though he can doubt everything, he couldn't doubt that he is the one who was doing the doubting. According to him, there are innate perfect ideas in his mind that were placed there by a benevolent god. And as such, he could reveal the absolute only with the power of his mind, that is, independent of experience. For Descartes, God made sure our rational minds could conclude the truth, but for those who eliminate consciousness, the mind does not exist, and moreover, they avoid making any appeal to supernatural explanations. This means that the only way that they can make a third-person objective claim on empirical reality without using any theory which is falsifiable, historical, incomplete, and subjective is by creating a perfect ideal language that is natural and as such can be used in order to judge between two conflicting theories as the logical positivists wished to create. With the use of this language, human existence will be a mere instrument of recording meaningful data rather than having an explanatory power. Ideal formal language can calculate the right answers because logic, in the structure of language, is like a calculus, and as such it is objective. It is independent of our activities and, in fact, determines them. The rules of logic force us to see truth and don't require members of any society to agree on them. As a result, things that exist independently of the conditions of knowing them will be known objectively. But so far, any attempt to do so has failed. Any scientific inquiry is backed up by a theory, which also means it cannot be neutral in the first place. Any theoretical explanation has value and aims to make its truth claims more coherent rather than matching observation of raw data to the logical and mathematical formula that corresponded to it. It involves adding new content about why things are the way they are, while using a theory of knowledge which can explain how we know what we believe to know. This theory requires a foundation for meaning, and in order to provide any theoretical explanation, one has to assert the essence of this foundation. In the case of the logical positivist, language is the foundation of meaning, 
and its essence is to verify the truth of the empirical world. With the use of language, we name objects and make truth statements about them in order to determine whether these correspond to the actual world, since they argue that reality and language have the same logical structure. The essence of language is only to verify, to be scientific. If we don't do that by using language, we utter meaningless sounds. But language can be used in different ways that cannot be reduced to propositions, which nevertheless have meaning to the speaker. There is no one logic of language, as Wittgenstein came to realize. And as Heidegger argued, the logic of being precedes both the logic of formal ideal language that consists only of formulas, and ordinary physical language which consists of sounds and grammatical rules. There is context to language and mutual implicit understandings between speakers, which is the background for speaking and writing, and as such, to any attempt to tell the truth for any theorizing about the world or how we know it for that matter. Being is the context, that mutual understanding in which beings, meanings, show themselves. Without this background, the meaning of objects cannot be expressed. This means that existence, which is ignored by neuroscientists and philosophers who try to eliminate consciousness, is the possibility for them to objectify the brain in the first place. Moreover, the primary of existence cancels out the possibility that the present can even be traced to any fundamental layer of reality, since the past is consistently revived in the present when it meets a new possibility. That is, the future. Existence is an undetermined creative space for meaning, and as such, the physical objective world cannot have authority over the mental subjective world. To have consciousness is not merely to have a subjective experience of this or that object, but to exist in a world with others. Dolores, as an android, realized in the third season that she cannot find her mind in Westworld, a determined perfect artificial world. She realized that she can only find her mind in the actual world, with other human beings in which the future can be opened to difference. Since, when it does, the past that was given to her by the mad scientists of Westworld can be revived, rather than determining who she is.